Good afternoon. You are listening to Voices de las Américas, the peoples of the Abia Yala. To be Wampanoag is inside you. It's really something that you can be proud of. When I read these words, I, a native indigenous Quechua descendant living in Nashville, Tennessee, I'm transported immediately back to my roots, my culture, and my music. And I connect with my ancestors and their voices all the way back in Peru and Bolivia. I hear the voices of the Wampanoag people's ancestors, who have lived for at least 10,000 years in Aquina, Gayhead, and throughout the islands of Nopi and the Commonwealth of Massachusetts here in the United States. These voices tell me that from Patagonia to Alaska, we, the indigenous peoples of the Abia Yala territory, are here, present, and alive. Good afternoon, my name is Lorraine Segovia Paz, and today, on Voices de las Americas, we will hear two descendants of indigenous communities in the United States. Jay Winter Nightwolf, veteran activist, writer, historian, and broadcaster who proudly bears the blood of his Cherokee, Taino, and Soshani ancestors, will speak with Stephanie Duckworth, author of indigenous descent from the Wampanoag tribe of Aquina, gay head of Massachusetts. Stephanie Duckworth will tell us about her book, Pone Sequa, Goddess of the Waters. The story follows 10-year-old girl Mackenzie Jones, who has not fully embraced her culture and her journey to feel comfortable in her own skin. Although this book was written for children, adults, American or immigrant, men and women alike, will be able to find their own voice in Mackenzie's journey. So, por favor, join us. Grandfather, Great Spirit, 
you have always been. And before you, no one has been. There is no other to pray to but you. You yourself. Everything you see, everything has been made by you. The star nations all over the universe, you have finished. The four quarters of the earth, you have finished. The day, and in that day, everything you have finished. Grandfather, great spirit, close. Lean close to the earth that you may hear the voice I send. You towards where the sun goes down, behold me. Thunder beings, behold me. You where the great giant lives in power, behold me. You where the sun shines continually, whence come the daybreak star and the day, behold me. You where the summer lives, behold me. You in the depths of the heavens, an eagle of power, behold and you, Grandmother Earth, the only mother, you who have shown mercy to your children, hear me, four quarters of the world, a relative I am. Give me strength to walk the soft earth, a relative to all that is. Give me eyes to see and the strength to understand that I may be like you with your power. Only can I face the winds. Great spirit, great spirit, my grandfather. All over the earth, the faces of living things are all alike. With tenderness have these come up out of the ground. Look upon these faces of children without number and with children in their arms that they may face the winds and walk the road to the day of quiet. This is my prayer. Hear me. The voice I have sent forward to you is weak, yet with earnestness I have sent it. Hear me. It is finished. OCO, greetings. I'm Jay Winter Night Wolf, and this is the American Indian's Truce Night Wolf, the most dangerous show on radio. It is so good to be with you again tonight, the Native American Indian. We have been in the Western Hemisphere since time immemorial. Some say 50,000 years and some say more, but we have always been here. And when others came to visit, we welcomed them with open arms. When the Chinese came, they spent very little time, but they came in peace. When the African came over 6,000 years ago, they came in peace, and then they left. But unfortunately, when the European came this way, it was not a peace mission. It was a mission that was designed to take whatever they wanted at any 
cost, even to the almost annihilation of the indigenous people of the Western Hemisphere. However, we won't dwell on that because there, you out there that know who I am and listen to this show know that I encompass the entire human family, the red, the black, the white, and the yellow. Nobody's any better than anybody else. And if you think you are, then you got another thought coming. I'm Jay Winner Nightwolf. And again, this is the American Indian's Truce, Nightwolf. The most dangerous show on radio. Don't go away. I've got a very special guest for you tonight here in the studio. And we'll be right back. And welcome back to Night Wolf, the most dangerous show on radio. We have a very special guest in the studio. We tried to get in here a couple of weeks ago, but she got a block away from the studio and the police stopped her for nothing. Anyway, let me tell you about who she is. And she's going to be here for a couple of days. My, my good friend, Stephanie Duckworth Elliott. She is the author Panasaqua, Goddess of the Waters. It's a children's book. But you know what? After reading this book three or four times, I find that it's a book for everybody, not just for children. Let me tell you a little bit about who she is. She is a member of the Wampanoag tribe of Gay Head Aquina. It is a federally acknowledged Native American tribe, and she grew up on the island of Chappaquiddick, part of Martha's Vineyard. Stephanie has over 15 years of experience as a minority educator, both in and out of the classroom. She has two graduate degrees, one in sociology and the other in nonprofit management. She's an expert with nonprofits. Her teaching experience spans from second to sixth grade to teaching over 75 university classes. Ms. Duckworth Elliott also has had the honor to be the Assistant Executive Director of the National Commission on the High School Senior Year, funded by the U.S. Department of Education under President Bill Clinton, and has written numerous reports focusing on education. Well, we got in the studio tonight, and I just want to say to all of you, here's my sister, my friend, Stephanie Duckworth Elliott. Welcome here. Thank you, Night Wolf. It is such a joy to be here in the studio with you, finally. <laughs> yes, it is. Most people don't go through the police to get to me. <laughs> I think it depends who you ask. Uh, <laughs> anyway, you Stephanie, I wanna, um, we're going to spend some time with you this afternoon, this evening, and we're going to talk about you, we're going to talk about your book, and we're going to talk about why you're here in Washington. And we'll be right back after this music break. I'm Jay with a Night Wolf. Don't go away. We'll be right back.
And I know everybody know who that is. That's Joseph Farcro from his new album entitled Face the Music. And that's cut number 11 entitled Face the Music. One of my best friends for many years, Joseph Farcro. In the studio tonight, Stephanie Duckworth Elliott. Hello. How you doing? Good. I'm thankful to be here, Nate Wolf. Tell us a little bit about who you are. I don't know where to start. Um, well, let's just say that um, I'm an educator. I define myself as a minority educator. And I have done this in the classroom, but I also have done this pretty much everywhere in terms of my walk here on earth, dealing with other people. And Very I, special journey, right? It is a special journey. I have an um, internal passion. Um, for those of you who have been to my website or have um, read any of my recent articles, understand a little bit about my personal journey that I've been on. But th for those who have not, um, i like to just talk a little bit about that. Go right ahead. Okay. Well, one of the unique things of growing up on Chappaquiddick, which is part of Martha's Vineyard, um, it's about 25 miles away from the tribal lands and the tribal community of Aquina. Even though I was very much a part of that community, I still had a little different upbringing than some of the people up there. Mm -hmm. um, I grew up at my grandfather's farm, mm -hmm. and my parents left. They not only split up, but they left when I was 10 years old, and my grandfather uh, had the honor of bringing me up. You had the honor of growing up underneath your grandfather. That's right. I sure <laughs> did. and taught me a lot. But I think one of the most important pivotal points in my life as far as my development was when I was 13 and I was about to sign up for college classes, uh, not college classes, high school classes in terms of looking at my future. My guidance counselor said that I was not college material based on the color of my skin and based on the fact that I was Wampanoag. Wampanoags don't go to school. They don't go to college. Your mother didn't go to college. Your brother didn't go to college. And, of course, my grandfather had an eighth-grade education. Mm -hmm. At this point, we made the decision that I move away mm -hmm. from home, um, go to a different school, get a job when I was 14 years old, making beds. I was a chambermaid on the weekends. And that really taught me to rely on myself. And I was an emancipated minor at the age of 17. And luckily for me, um, I not only had my grandfather, I met a lot of really good people along the way, and I was able to get accepted to Rutgers University. And I took a, bought a map, took my 1980 Impala, and drove to New Jersey, and I changed my life. At 17? At 17. Um, definitely there's been bumps along the way, but I think that that encouragement that I got from my grandfather, because my grandfather made it all happen, to say that I believe in you. And actually, he told me that I was the only person. He said that I was his hope. I was his light. Um, and I was his last chance hmm. in and his what, what family. Did, what did he mean by that? Well, I think that, you know, unfortunately, I think his daughter disappointed him. Um, I think other people in his family has disappointed him. And he wanted to carry on a legacy of prosperity, just like he was trying to give to his children and, of course, to me. Um, so I can rest assured, Grandpa, that your legacy is being continued not only with me, but with further generations. All right. Panasaqua, Goddess of the Waters. I've had that book for several months. I've written, I've, I've written it. I've read it four times. And every time I read it, that's, Stephanie, that's, that's not a children's book. That's an everybody's book. It is an everybody book. Um, you know, yes, I've geared it towards 8 to 14-year-olds, but really I was speaking today at, um, at a charter school here in Washington, D.C., at a high school, and I spoke with several groups, not just high school students but middle school students. Everybody gradu have gravitated to this book. Um, so I think the concepts in it, the story, Mackenzie Jones is the heroine or the main character, and her journey is something that everybody can relate to, not just girls, boys too, and adults. But Stephanie, I read the book, and, and you and I have gotten to know each other as friends, as, as my Native American sister. And that's not a fictional book. That book is about you. 
It is. It is biographical. A lot of it, I would say maybe 85% of it is based on my own struggles of trying to fit in. Um, mm -hmm. You know, the story is, for those of you who don't know, I stand 6'1", that's flat-footed, without heels. Um, and I was actually this height at age 12. Um, I grew very fast. And then growing up in an environment like the one I just described to you, um, that I was the only one or got criticized or marginalized based on the fact that I was Wampanoag, it was very difficult for me. So part of the story deals with that. Mackenzie Jones takes her journey coming from that standpoint of trying to fit in. Would you read us a passage from that book? Absolutely. And then, then I'm going to tell folks where you're going to be this weekend, okay? Okay. Well, in honor of um, our day of mourning, which some of you may call it Thanksgiving, I'm going to read a little passage that pertains to this celebration. I, a Wampanoag warrior, have not forgotten, my little one, Mackenzie's grandfather explained. Since 1970s, many Native Americans gather at noon on Coles Hill in Plymouth to commemorate a national day of mourning on the national Thanksgiving holiday. Since I cannot make my way to Plymouth every year, I do the next best thing. I go out to be one with nature and call upon our ancestors and ask them to heal our people so we may rise someday and be whole again. Doing this is a reminder of the murder of millions of our people, the theft of our lands, and the relentless assault on our culture. It is a day of remembrance and a spiritual connection as well as a protest of the racism and oppression which we as Wampanoags continue to experience. Long before he had finished, Mackenzie's eyes were running with tears. For the first time in her life, she felt emotion all over her body. She did not know what to do. Was she to scream? yell, dry her tears, jump up and down. She was confused. Oh, my little one, just let the tears come, your, her wise grandfather told her. They will cleanse you and make you whole at the same time. You need to feel this kind of hurt. It allows you to see the truth with fresh eyes. I told you all of this so you can start to understand how many people have cared for you and are still caring for you, who want you to embrace your culture and love who you are. You come from proud people, people who have fought for the right to exist, to live as one with the animals and the land. Nothing you can have in life is better than the feeling of belonging to something, someone, and somewhere. Your home is in your blood. Your place of peace is already within you. You just have to grab a hold of it and give thanks to all you have around you. He gathered Mackenzie into his arms, and she knew that one journey was ending and a new one beginning. What journey was ending? Her life where she was seeking mm -hmm. her peace. And the new one is that she has found it, and it's really a journey of love and being proud of who she is. That's uh, Stephanie Duckworth Elliott. She just read a passage from her book, Panasaqua, Goddess of the Waters. Okay. We got a little bit of news for you, and then we're going to come back and talk to Stephanie Duckworth Elliott. I'm Jay Wood and Night Wolf. I'm Jay Wood and Night Wolf. Hi, how are you, Tay? Don Walker, and this is the Native Voice Speaks tonight. Yaqui Riberi ancestors killed in 1902 massacre from Indians.com. The Yaqui of Mexico and the U.S. Riberi 12 sets of remains in a ceremony in Mexico on Monday. The ancestors were the victims of a 1902 massacre in Mexico. Government troops killed about 150 men, women, and children as part of a brutal campaign against the Yaqui people some of whom fled to Arizona and became recognized as the Pasqua Yaqui tribe. The remains ended up in the collection of the American Museum of Natural History in New York. The Yaqui, the, the Pasqua Yaqui tribe, sought them under the Native American Graves Protection and Re Repatriation Act. The Mexican government also got involved on behalf of the Yaqui who still live there. 
That is why the warrior's role is important, because when we make territorial claims, it is because Yaqui blood was spilled there. Mexican Yaqui elder Ernesto Aquiles told the Associated Press, this is the first opportunity we have had to stop and mourn. The Yaqui in Arizona held a ceremony for the remains before they were reburied in Mexico. Oneida Nation returns to corn farming tradition. The Oneida Nation of Wisconsin is returning to its corn farming tradition with the hopes of improving tribal members' health and preserving tribal culture. The Oneidas went to their ancestral homeland in New York 16 years ago to obtain seeds for white corn. The tribe harvests the corn at a farm on the reservation. Even though we've been removed from New York, we're still connected. The white corn goes back to the creation story to provide for our people. Vicki Cornelius, the manager of the tribal cannery, told the Milwaukee Journal Centennial, the Oneida gave white corn to George Washington and his troops to help them survive a harsh winter during the Revolutionary War. Group fight sacred site protection in New Mexico, 11-1909, IndianZ.com. A group of landowners and energy companies is challenging the placement of Sacred Mount Taylor on the Register of Cultural Properties in New Mexico. The group filed suit against the New Mexico Cultural Properties Review Committee. The plaintiffs say the committee violated the state's Open Meeting Act and that placing Mount Taylor on the register amounts to government endorsement of tribal religion. I, I believe they did that in the Constitution. Acoma? Pueblo, Laguna Pueblo, Zuni Pueblo, the Navajo Nation, and the Hopi Tribe consider Mount Taylor to be one of their most significant sites. They want to protect the site from uranium development. It's a very sacred place to those people. The Tiqua Tribe rejoins Pueblo Council after 329 years, Indians.com. The Tiqua Tribe of Texas has rejoined the All-Indian Pueblo Council after an absence of 329 years. The Tiquas used to live in present-day New Mexico but moved to present-day Texas following the 1680 Pueblo Revolt. They sought to rejoin AIPC and were officially welcomed on Monday. This is a historical event, Tiqua Councilman Jose Lopez said, told the El Paso Times. The Tiquas have been waiting for this opportunity for a very long time. The Pueblo tribes formed AIPC in the 1598 to address common issues and to deal with Spanish settlers and other tribes. Public Radio International, swine flu threatens Yanomami in the Amazon. H1N1 has now reached an indigenous group deep in the Amazon. A thousand members of the Yanomami tribe are believed to have caught the flu. Seven have died. The government of Venezuela has sealed up part of the rainforest to prevent the flu from decimating the Yanomami Indians. Survival International is a London-based indigenous rights group. Its research and field director, Fiona Watson, believes the flu came in through Novaca, an area in the Yanomami territory which has the most contact with the outside world. The Yanomami are the largest of the isolated indigenous groups in the Amazon rainforest. There are about 32,000 in Brazil and Venezuela. They have very little immunity and have suffered from other epidemics in the past that were introduced from outside their community. I'm Jay Wanna Night Wolf. We're on the area I take. Don Walker. And this is Native Voice Speaks from Indian Country Today. Talk to you next week with the news. You are listening to Voices de las Americas, the peoples of the Avia Yala. Jay Winter Night Wolf is interviewing Stephanie Duckworth, author and member of the Wampanoag tribe of Aquana Gayhead in Massachusetts. Usted está escuchando Voices de las Américas del Avia Yala. Jay Winter Night Wolf tiene como invitada a la autora Stephanie Duckworth, quien es miembro de la tribu Wampanoag de Aquana Gayhead del estado mancomunado de Massachusetts.
Nobody can play that flute like Joseph Firecrow. Nobody. And there are some great there are, there are some great flute players out there, you know. Uh, Jeff Ball, R. Carlos Nakai, Mary Youngblood, and I can name them on and on and on. I know most of them. But for me, nobody can play that flute like Joseph Firecrow. And I know you're listening tonight, Joseph, so, you know, um, I already got a big head, bro, so, you know, just have to get a bigger hat. Anyway, I'm in the studio tonight with my sister and my friend. Stephanie Duckworth Elliott. Stephanie, when you heard that last song, <clears throat> I know that took you back to the times that you were walking through the fields of a Chappaquiddick with your grandpa and and all of those animals following you around and and you trying to take care of them, they're trying to take care of you and it takes you back to the times when grandpa just stopped and had these heart-to-heart -heart talks with you, I know that brought back a lot of memories, didn't it? It's not just memories for me, actually. I was definitely thinking of Chappaquiddick, and I was thinking of the ocean. Um, you know, I will say something out of the book. Um, you'll find out that uh, Panasequa is my name, and one of my guides is, is an element, which is water, the goddess of the waters, that's what it means in English. So my place of peace, I immediately go when I think about remembering or honoring or when I go to um, to that place in terms of meditation, for me, it's always to water. So that actually that's what I was thinking about in terms of what's calming me. You know, Stephanie, you live in two worlds. You live in the world of our people. But you also live in this world where you have to be credentialized with degrees and, 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 and um, you know what I'm saying? Oh, absolutely. H how, do you, how do you balance that? I think that there's only one way to balance that, and it's through speaking the truth. Mm. And whether you get those credentials or not, the bottom line is that you have to speak the truth and you have to stay true to yourself. Now, I could sit here and spend five hours talking to you about all of my educational and professional experiences where I have had the opportunity to speak the truth. I've been beaten down, but I always seem to rise. And I really believe, and that's the message also that I give to children or young people when they listen to me speak, is that, you know, as much as all that the glitz and the glam or it looks like an easier path to, to take its or someone says to you, just be quiet, just take it, it's not the easier path. Because mm -hmm. every time you do that, a little piece of you dies. So I actually, you know, I've come to this conclusion after doing this for, for a few years. I mean, 15 years is not a long time, but it is, you know, long enough to know. It's not so much about a balancing act. It's really about staying true to yourself and what you believe in, you know? Mm -hmm. You know... Stephanie, we met the first time earlier in the year through a friend, mm -hmm. and um, and we've been communicating. I had you on the show back then. Yes, and in April. Uh, April, yeah, to be exact. And 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 not only are you great with what you do, but you jumped in there with us to hire, try to help our sisters and brothers that are a lot less fortunate than most people out here out in the west, out in the plains, out in the southwest, with this fundraiser that we do every year. Mm -hmm. Because our people have been wrong for so many years that it has left them devastated mm -hmm. and poverty-stricken and suicidal and alcoholic. You know, not all of them, but some of them. But all of them suffer from poverty. Right. You know, it's interesting. Today when I was at the charter school, one of the young women here in Washington, D.C. asked me, how did you handle growing up and with the constant sort of disrespect or, you know, handling situations where you're not accepted? How did that affect you? Why do you have a positive attitude? This one young girl, young woman, she was about 15 or 16 years old, 
And I have to say, my answer was to her, I said, it wasn't easy. But I had one person that I always went back to, just one, who said that they believed in me and that they loved me, who is my grandfather. And you have to hold on to that. And I'm not going to say that it's easy, but you have to make sure, you know, my grandfather told me, you have two choices in life. You can either choose to live or you can choose to die. And if you choose to live, it's a constant struggle. And it's really the only choice that we have. It's a constant struggle, but life brings pain. Yes. From the time you get here until the time you die, there's pain in one form or or another. It could be spiritual pain, emotional pain, physical pain, psychological pain, you know, but you will endure some pain in this life. How do you handle that? Well, I think for me... Um, another thing that has been a drawing force, of course, has been my spirituality, my relationship with the Creator. I think that having a, a, a base, a foundation, a value system of love um, will carry you through. I've been in situations, I remember specifically when I was in graduate school, my first degree, and I had to choose one day between buying a train ticket to New York City I was going to graduate school in New York but living in New Jersey or buying food and I you know bent down and and kneeled down and I prayed and I said I I really want to choose to go to school please show me a way so I chose to go to school when I got into New York City I happened to meet somebody who took me out to dinner Mm -hmm. and from that point on um it, it, it seems that if I've chosen the way of the Creator and giving thanks to everything that I've given, uh, been given, that everything in my life has seemed to have been fallen into place. I think that, that that's important, and that's why I actually have gotten involved with your fund drive, and what you're doing is so important. I, you know, I have enough. I have enough right now. I may not be wealthy in terms of other people's standards, but I have enough. And I have to be able to give to others, and I'm thankful for what I do have. Hmm. Another thing that I want to talk about, Stephanie, something that everybody that knows about this is very, very proud of you for. You are the very first Native American woman, not to mention Native American to bring in existence a Native American-owned, woman-owned publishing company. Yes, yes. And it's called Wampum Books. Yes. And I am so proud of you. You Tell us a little bit about that. Well, I have to say, Jay, that um, it was your radio show in April that really started the ball rolling. I don't even know if you know this. No, I don't. (laughs) Um, When I was on your radio show in April... And I was a guest along with some uh, Vincent Blackhawk. Mm-hmm. And we were commenting on the documentary, We Shall Remain. Um, I had conversations with your guest that night about doing their story. And I said, oh, what a great idea to do another per- person's story. I approached the publisher that I was using. And I said, gosh, you should do this story. This person is famous and, you know, it would be a great second book for me. The first publisher that I went through said, you know, I'm really not interested. They were having financial struggles, and they eventually actually folded. Mm -hmm. Um, And I said, this is crazy. And and what is she doing that I can't do? So that, from that radio show, Mm. um, sparked the, the, I remember the drive. I drove from my house to Starbucks, and I decided in about five minutes that I'm going to start my own publishing company. Didn't know how I was going to do it, but I came up with a name in those five minutes as well, Wampum Books. Um, And it has grown since then. Um, It's actually grown to a point where right now we start rolling out with our five authors starting in um, February of Mm -hmm. 2010. Mm -hmm. Um, Wampum Books specializes in Native Indigenous writers, however, not limited to, but I do have that special affinity. We do pretty much all genres except erotica and urban fiction because of my value systems. I believe that people 
um, need to read everything else, and we have a lot of authors that do those things. So I really want to um, really focus on the writers. Uh, my native indigenous writers who start rolling out are people like John Hopkins. He's Narragansett. He lives in Arizona. Uh, Daryl Tonema, who is one of your uh, colleagues here in terms of a musician, he starts rolling out with his book. Vincent Blackhawk, who most of you know, who directed Ghost Writers. And the m one of the most important people is you, Jay Winter Nightwolf. I am actually here in the studio live with a contract that I'd really like you to sign because I'd like to do your memoirs. Are you up for it? Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, I'd like to give you this contract from Wampum Books for your memoirs. And um, we've talked about what type of title. And the, the working title that we have for your memoirs is The Bleeding Has to Stop. And I think everybody can say that that's appropriate when it comes to you. Why'd you do this to me now? I'm sitting over here crying. <laughs> well, I think it's important. Mm -hmm. I think your story, Jay, has to be told. And I think one of the reasons why we have come together and we've met is not just promoting and talking about what I'm doing, which is a wonderful thing for our communities, bringing back infrastructure and building our communities, bringing the money home, telling a message to our uh, young Native Americans that, listen, you don't have to... Tr to leave the reservation. You don't have to leave the community to be somebody, to do something. You can bring it home. But I want to do your story because you have so long been the voice for us. You have fought so long for, for different things that we have believed in, and you have suffered for us, and I think other people really need to know your story. So here you go. Please, I'd, please I'd, sign it because be I've signed it. I'd be <laughs> <no>. <laughs> I'm on it, Stephanie. I, I really am. I, um, mm. Okay. Um. Here we go, everybody. He's signing. And just to let everybody know, hopefully our expected date for J. Renner Nightwolf's um, memoirs is in September 2010. Uh, we will let everybody know. Hopefully we'll have a nice big launch. And he will then be on his book tour. It's official. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank I'm, you. Uh, can, 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 um, mm, I don't know what to say now. You just blew me away. Um, mm. um, For those people who are interested in finding out more information about Wampum Books, the website should be live today. I checked it this morning, wampumbooks.com, or you can go to my personal website, duckworthelliot.com, to find out more information of how to submit your ideas and manuscripts. And I am looking for, you know, women writers. Um, for some reason, I've attracted all these wonderful, beautiful Native men, which is okay. <laughs> but I also need to support our women out there. So come on, ladies. Yeah. Come on, sisters. We need your help. Anyway, um, Stephanie Duckworth Elliott, thank you so much um, for being here today and being a part of the show and any last words? Just to be true to yourself. All right. We're going to close the show tonight. Um, I have no closing words. Um, except uh, I am your brother and I am your servant. Servant of the people. Appointed by the great spirit. I love you all. All of you. I'm Jay Winter Nightwolf. Dana da goai. Wado. Talk to you next week.
Muchas gracias por escucharnos y permitir que Voices de las Américas ingresen a sus hogares. Thank you for listening to Voices de las Américas. The voices, experiences, and ancestral knowledge of the indigenous or native communities of Abya Yala. Now we would like to invite you to listen to the music of three U.S. Native American indigenous musicians. The first one is Shelley Morningsong with I Walk in Two Worlds. Shelley is the winner of the 2019 Native American Music Awards Artist of the Year and has recorded seven sensational Native American contemporary albums and has emerged as one of New Mexico's finest Native performers. The second one is Peter Lafarge with Hey Mr. President. Lafarge grew up partly in New Mexico and partly on the King Ranch in Colorado. He shared a love and respect with his father for the histories and cultures of Native Americans. He also claimed to be distantly descended from the Narragansett Indian tribe through his New England ancestors. And finally, we will hear the Six Nations women singers with Yoho Oho. The Six Nations Women Singers is one of the most influential female Native American singing groups. An arm of the larger organization, the Six Nations Women's Singing Society. The group has recorded with Robbie Robertson and performed at the presidential inauguration in 1997. The group, which includes members of the Seneca, Ono Ondaga, and Cayuga tribes, focuses on the religious and social music and dance of the Longhouse tradition. Gracias. Enjoy them.
Hey, Mr. President, we're gonna charge you rent for every treaty broken, for every treaty bent. We're making reservations, they're gonna be just for whites. We'll be honest about the white man's rights. Hey, Mr. President, we're gonna charge you rent for every treaty broken and every treaty bent. We're gonna be the tourists, we'll come to see you dance. You let us know the reason why you plans. Oh, well, hey, Mr. President, we're gonna charge you rent for every treaty broken and every treaty bent. We're not unpatriotic, we just like to see, like to see your culture, how intriguing it will be. Well, now, hey, Mr. President, we're gonna charge you rent for every treaty broken and every treaty bent. You get out your medicine men, you get out your squaws, and we'll give you justice under Indian laws. Well, now, hey, Mr. President, we're gonna charge you rent for every treaty broken and every treaty bent. I said, now, hey, hey, Mr. President, we're gonna charge you rent. 